for any potential small business owner or entrepreneur that's out there today, you know, I would say a couple things to you. Uh, you know, when, when, you, when you flip on the news and you, and you look at the state of the economy, you look at where gas prices are going, you look at some of the favoritism, regulations, healthcare, all the different things that could work against you as an entrepreneur or a small business owner, I, I would still say to go for it because you know, this country was built on taking risks and taking challenges on. And if you're someone out there who has that idea in your head and, and you're really thinking about moving forward, I'd say you've got to find a way to take the plunge, take the risk, and move forward because entrepreneurism and small business ownership is what's going to drive this country moving forward. It all kind of started as a conversation. I was living with my brother and uh, some of his friends at George Mason University. We're hanging out having a beer one day and I said, yeah guys, I think I'm gonna start my own business. I'm gonna start a boat cleaning service. And, and three guys were sitting there, they all started laughing. And uh, one of them looks at me from behind the couch and he says, hey, uh, what are you gonna call it? Barnacle Jim's Boat Service? I wasn't laughing, I thought it was a great name. So within about three or four days, I had business cards, these little white business cards. I got them as cheap as I could and it had a little picture of a boat and it said Barnacle Jim's Boat Service. Jim has definitely always been entrepreneurial. He, he's worked ever since I've known him. So that's, I guess at age 12 or 14, he, he was always working. I remember buying into a, um, I guess it was kind of like a franchise. They had this special product to put on boats, to put on cars, and you had to, you had to put in, I think, like five or $10,000 and actually Carrie, uh, Carrie fronted the money to me. They had forgotten that I, <laughs> that I had done that. And I bought a book on boat cleaning. It had little uh, cartoon pictures in it. And I read the book and I kind of learned a little bit. I bought some products, I talked to guys at marinas. And then to launch the business, I, uh, I printed up some flyers on like eight and a half by 11 paper about boat cleaning and kind of what my rate was gonna be. And I went to a local marina that was a nice marina and had a lot of nice boats. And uh, I put the flyers all over the boats. It was just me in the beginning. And I think for that, first, uh, for that first summer, I did most of the work myself, and then I brought my brother on part-time. After a couple years, we uh, started doing uh, car detailing. We had a truck that had water, electricity, and everything on it, and we would go to people's homes and offices. And in 1994, we were cleaning a lady's car, and we had the opportunity to get into aviation. And she said to us, hey, my father operates a Gulfstream and a Westwind and a Hawker at National Airport. Would you guys be interested? And uh, we were very interested. We went and met with them. They were our first customer. Sharp Details cleans and supports corporate and private aviation departments from Virginia to Connecticut. Basically, whatever services you can, would like to have done on your car, we provide to an aircraft. Anywhere from any exterior cleaning, uh, waxing, polishing, bright work, to uh, paint sealant protection, a wet wash or a dry wash, to an interior cleaning. So we provide top-notch services to several of our clients in multiple locations up and down the East Coast. From where I sit, because as the wife of a small business owner, to me, the word company doesn't look like an office building. It looks like, you know, a big group of people <laughs> standing together. And then, you know, coming out from there are all of their families and all of their communities. So keeping those companies healthy means keeping communities healthy. It means keeping kids who are in school healthy. It, it means all of those things. For us, it's really about the people. And, and, and that's how we've been able to become successful. I feel like it's my little own business. I, I wake up every morning, I come to work. I don't like how some people, I gotta work in the morning. And I, I don't feel like that in the mornings. I could stay here for an hour and talk about Jim, really. I, I like his um, human side. He's really nice to work with. He gives me that empowerment to make sure that this company and also for myself to grow. Other companies, it's, I felt like I wasn't really managing, even though I was in a managed position, but I still felt like I was being micromanaged. You know, somebody tells you something to do, you just go do it. Yeah, it's a win-win situation. You make sure your employees are taken care of, and the employees make sure that the customer is taken care of. puts every penny he can back in his employees to just watch them, watch the possibilities. 
I think he, he is inspired by watching others succeed. We have a, uh, an individual, um, she's a wonderful lady. She's, she's a, uh, a single mom of six, uh, six children. And what we've done with her is she ran our uh, janitorial division. And now what we've done is we've actually started a second company called Mayday Mayday. And that company is really gonna be hers to run. I do enjoy working for Shop Details. And now with this new project that we have, Mayday Mayday, it's, um, it's excited. We're providing her with the business cards, the back office support, um, all the marketing materials, but she's out there day to day learning how to sell, learning how to interact with the customer, and then providing the service as well. I talked to Jim and I said, um, this is my idea. I wanna have a um, home cleaning services. And uh, he didn't hesitate, you know, he said, you know, let's go for it. I like your idea and um, let's get it going. I mean, Jim says she'll sit there almost like with tears in her eyes saying, thank you, I can't, you know, thank you. When really it's her hard work that makes him want to say yes. You know, I, I try to look at the facts. I try to look at, at look at it from a financial aspect, but I'm, I'm an optimist. So whenever I have a gut feeling that something's going to work out or it's going to go well, I usually jump in with both feet. I'm very happy to be working with him. And um, I see myself retiring from here. <laughs>something that's really interesting that's happened over the last few years in our industry, you know, there's been a lot of uh, vilification of people that use private or corporate jets. And, and I think what people think about is they think about a Bernie Madoff or someone like that that's flying around on a golf stream on other people's dime, you know, eating caviar and drinking champagne. And I think there's been a distortion of the facts. The predominant group of corporate jets that operate in America are really mid-level managers, engineers, people flying to plants that don't have easily accessible airports, you know, they can't do it on an airline. When you demonize an industry that large that's worth billions of dollars, um, the trickle down is amazing. We had several customers that just shut their airplanes down. They quit using them, uh, you know, for some, some of them months at a time. So, you know, the impact on our business is immediate. If they're not flying the jet, we're not cleaning it. You know, and we still have people we need to pay. You would want to have faith in, in the system that that the regulations and the laws and bills put into place are, are there to push you forward. And if they're not, then that's unfortunate. One of the biggest challenges we face is the regulatory issues with the government. I mean, when you talk about healthcare and you talk to small business owners, you know, healthcare is one of our most uh, expensive costs that we have to doing business. And, and with the new bill that's been passed and the new healthcare uh, regulations that are coming down the pike, we don't know how that's gonna change. If we're bidding on something now, that's gonna be a three or five year contract, how do we say to the customer, okay, well, here, here's what our price is now, but, but when all this healthcare stuff kicks in, our price is gonna go up to X. You know, a customer is gonna have a hard time understanding that. We have a hard time planning for that because we still don't know what the cost is gonna be. You know, two years ago, my healthcare went up 25%. I know what a lot of small businesses did is they stopped providing healthcare. They said to their employees, sorry, we're not gonna do this anymore. We've continued to do it. And what we do is we continue to absorb that cost. The problem with that is it's still an unknown. So if we budget, you know, $50,000 in 2014 for the increased cost and it ends up being 100, well now we're off by $50,000. This could send costs up dramatically, which might prevent us from e either giving raises, hiring additional people, maybe it'll affect the money we can spend on training. Uh, it just provides a lot of uncertainty for us and that's never good as a small business owner. When you when you sit down and think about opportunities, I think I think yes, regulations can can be an obstacle. And sometimes you just have to clear the obstacle. And you know, I think that's always possible. One thing the government could do to help people like me, the small business owners, you know, simplify things a little bit. You know, is this helping the small business owner sign that paycheck or, or isn't it? I just think it's that simple. If your leaders haven't done that, you know, haven't had to consider all that goes into keeping a company healthy, it makes it hard for them to make that decision from that perspective. You know, I just, I, I chuckle when I look at some of the things that happen in D.C. And, you know, all I would say to anybody out there listening is, you know, as a small business owner, we work hard, uh, we get in the trenches, we do what we need to do to make sure that we succeed. What happens in Washington, we don't have a lot of control over. I have no interest in hiring lobbyists to, to try to fight certain regulations. What we look for is, I, I think it's really simple. What can be done for small businesses that allows us to continue to expand and continue to add jobs to help America get back on its feet?
when the economy constricts a little bit, when we start facing these regulations, we kind of go into fight mode. And, and, and what we do is that's when we really look to expand because we don't want to have to go back to our people and tell them that their job no longer exists. We don't want to tell them that we're going to have to cut their pay in order to keep them. We're fighters at Sharp Details and we're always going to keep charging ahead the best we can. But there's going to be an obvious point um, in this where you can't continue to hire people, you can't continue to give raises, you might have to make some cuts in your employees so that you're making money and making enough cash to actually operate every day. I'll say it with the hope of not getting emotional. So if you pull Jim out of life, then you pull away an opportunity for others to achieve greatness. You know, because he, that's what he does and he does it subtly and he's not trying to do it. But, but he's, he's you know, extending himself and like I said before, it's, it's the light that comes out. 